fight was over. Her mother had ridden with her in the ambulance. She'd never seen her father again. She'd heard that he'd been roughed up pretty bad in prison. Apparently, inmates didn't really relate all that well to guys who cut up their own kids. The doctors who had sewn up her face had said that in another year, they'd be able to do some work on the scar to make it less noticeable. They'd also sent her to visit a woman who specialized in makeup for people with skin conditions and facial deformities. Sherry had gone to see her once, but the makeup had felt heavy on her skin, had cracked when she smiled, and had left the scar red and raw the next day. She'd cried for a long time after that. Even the lady who fixed up freaks couldn't help her. That night, Sherry slept like a baby, the smile still lingering on her face. In the morning, she got onto the bus refreshed and looking forward to the day. She took her usual spot directly behind the driver, but now she sat so that her head and shoulders rose up over the seat and would be in full view of the kids at the back of the bus. If they teased her today, that would be fine with her. Might as well be today, in fact, seeing as it would be one of their last opportunities to do it. Hey, scary face, someone called out. What happened? Cut yourself shaving? Roars of laughter. Sherry ignored the comment, wondering why no one could think of something better. Maybe she could come up with something, mention it to a few kids and see if it spread through the school. Something catchy like Slice Girl or Scarlet. Scary face, scary face, scary face. Someone whispered behind her. Sherry turned around and smiled. The kid behind her looked surprised at the move, his eyes growing wide with just a hint of fear. Good, thought Sherry. Get used to it, kid. There'd be plenty more where that came from. The kid looked away, unable to stare into Sherry's eyes for more than a few seconds. Sherry's smile widened, and she turned around in her seat. As the bus pulled away from the stop, she slipped her hands into her knapsack and ran her fingers along the handle, then traced a finger down to the plastic cover, sheathing the blade. The police had taken the knife as evidence, then had given it back to her and her mother a few months later when the trial was over and they didn't need it anymore. At the time, Sherry had wondered why the police thought they'd want the knife, but now she was glad they'd returned it. She closed the fingers of her right hand around the knife's rough wooden handle and slid the plastic cover off the blade with her left. The bus pulled into the school and stopped. The doors opened up to the schoolyard. She had wanted to be more like them, but that had been wrong. She knew that now. She tightened her grip on the knife and got off the bus. She could never be like them, but maybe she could make them a little bit more like her. When you ask that question, what if, it is to unsettle the reader, to make the reader think, to instill fear. Fear can be a very healthy thing. that chill down your spine. It can be cathartic. Ah, you know, you, you finish reading and you feel good because your body has been torn and twisted and turned a little different way. In the end, you feel relieved. It's very close to humor. The effect that the body goes through in a good scream is almost the same as a good laugh. One of my favorite authors of all time, Robert Bloch, the man who wrote Psycho. He was a very, very funny guy. A lot of his stories turned on that bit of humor turning to horror. And I think that's an important part of the horror genre. 
Release. Release. A good laugh, a good scare, a good cry, and they feel a lot better than when they started. I wasn't aware of a lot of childhood fears when I was growing up. All the horror writers I know have been very normal. That guy he delves into the darkness every day. The reality is that horror writers are some of the most adjusted people that you want to meet. Delving deep into someone else's psyche makes for an easier passage through everyday life. There's no greater evil that men can do is when they're doing it to each other. What's scary in your neighborhood? The serial killer that lives three doors down that hasn't killed anybody yet. Who knows whose first victim is going to be? You? Or your child? That's scary. Ed Gein was just a regular guy, according to all the people who lived in town. John Wayne Gacy was a community leader and he dressed up in clown outfits and did children's parties. He ended up having like 20 dead bodies buried under his house. That's scary. People say uh, when they discover these things, oh, you always think it's gonna happen in some other neighborhood, but you never expect it to happen to you in your neighborhood, and I think Oh yeah, you should expect it to happen in your neighborhood. Where else is it gonna happen? Right under your nose, that's where it's gonna happen. It doesn't happen to other people, it happens to you. That's been my philosophy. And it's done me well. I don't think the need of the reader to be thrilled or to be frightened has changed much over the course of human history. Greek tragedies. There was some scary stuff going on there too. There was scary stuff in Shakespeare. 
medieval times. Legends. Elizabeth Bathory, who bathed in the blood of young women from around her, her village. That's crazy. And that happened. I often say that things that are going on now, we say, oh my God, this day and age, whether it be uh, child molesters or murderers or mass murderers, serial killers, all of those things, those kinds of people existed throughout history. They're not a modern phenomenon. They're just being caught now. And their stories are being documented. The, the 10th century, if there was a serial killer about, who knew? Could be a nobleman. And who was going to question him? Who was going to do an investigation? Well, people went missing, so they made some kind of story about it. Killing without reason. For the thrill of it. For the sport of it. The need to know that there are dark forces in the world around us has always been there. Can you think of a more vulnerable place to be in? When things go bad. The orgasm is euphemistically called the little death. Sex and horror go together very well. It's quite integral to the horror genre. But it all comes down to the human instincts. You gotta still be afraid of crazy people. <laughs> and things going wrong beyond your control or just God wanting to turn the switch. In the horror genre in print, there are not a lot of taboos. I can think of every depravity known to man being examined at one point or another in the horror genre. Any kind of taboo that goes farther and beyond is usually dealt in the lower ranks. Children get killed off violent ways in books and stories in the horror genre all the time. I don't think there's a danger of it 
becoming widespread because the horror genre is a very small thing. It's very niche-like. Very few people seem to pay attention. Taboo for me, I think there's more skill involved in hinting at something, alluding to it, drawing the curtain before the nasty stuff happens. I think that'll always be that way with me. Killing off animals, I've done that a couple of times, and people have told me, well, we can't print this story because you killed this dog in this violent way as a family pet. Uh, I didn't have a problem with that, but uh, it eventually got published somewhere else. Children in that sort of situation is the one I'd probably stay away from the rest of my career. There are things like that. If you don't have to, then why? Are you going to shock somebody? Are you just going to turn them off? Yeah, I can write pretty graphically, but are my talents best used on something like that just for shock? Probably not. I had to come up with a story for an anthology, a collection of stories about superheroes. I came up with a story about a superhero who had cancer. I used everything that my wife was going through at the time. They discovered it through an x-ray. There was a lump in her chest. So I had the superhero having the same kind of thing because he'd been shot. First time in his whole career he'd been shot. Usually he'd been able to avoid bullets because he was slowing down because of the tumor. You know, the doctor says, well, I hate to, to tell you this. I don't know how to tell you this. And that was how the doctor told my wife about it. He was stunned. He couldn't believe it. All my life, I've been fighting evil, doing good. And that's what my wife said. I've never done anything wrong, she said. I've always lived my life good. How could this happen to me? So that's what my superhero was saying. My wife was the superhero. The only place where it diverged from real life was the ending. The doctor asks the superhero to sign an autograph for his son. And he decides, well, if I lived my life well, and I got cancer, maybe I'm going to spend the rest of my life living a life of evil. And he steals the doctor's pen. I've always said that one of my greatest fears is being afraid for someone else, being unable to do anything while someone else you love, a loved one, is suffering. And I've had that happen to me several times in my life. So you're standing in the hospital. I seem to have found myself doing it many times, standing in the hospital while some tragedy has befallen someone I love. And all I can do is pat them on the shoulder and say, they're there, it's going to be okay, when it's not going to be okay. It's going to be life-altering. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard for the rest of your life. You're always going to have this hanging over you. And all you can do is offer words of encouragement. And that's the best you can do. 
very hard. I've had to deal with that many times, and I think that comes up again and again in my fiction. I think a horror writer's got a feel for his victims. got to know what would really grab a reader. The kind of thing that you read and go, oh no, please don't let that happen. the end of my novel, Scream Queen, I had the final victim, the blonde-haired young woman, the heroine of the film. And she made it all the way through. And then I had her killed. because I wanted to, because that was unexpected, because, well, in real life, those kind of things happen. Everyone told me I shouldn't have done it, and a lot of people complained about the ending, but you know what? It's my book. I get to set the rules. I get to do whatever I want. And she was going down. That's the way it is. That's the great thing about being a writer. You get to create, you get to kill. It's not always the, the bad guy that, that gets it in the end. Killed the good person, let the bad people live. Unpopular maybe, but... That's a horror story.